Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. We'll read the first seven verses, Lord willing. Ecclesiastes, that's in the Old Testament. If you can find Psalms, Proverbs, keep on going, you close. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. We'll pray, and then we'll get started. Father God, we come to you, and I thank you for your good words. And God, maybe there is something in this word that we need to hear tonight, dear Lord. I know that there is. God, maybe maybe we don't need it right now. Maybe we'll need it later. or Maybe we do need it now. But God, regardless, let us hear it. Let us tuck tuck it away in our heart, dear Lord, so whether now or later, we'll recall it. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me and to each one of us that we understand your word as best as we can tonight. And I pray that it'll be all for your glory. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Now, when it speaks of the house of God there in in that time period, we'd uh, be talking about a tabernacle, sanctuary, temple, whatever it may be. And, and, and this is good advice for us, too, even though we don't have the temple today as they did in the Old Testament and in Jesus' day. That That is long gone. But when we come together, we come together, and we call this place a house of God uh, to some extent. Now, when we see the house of God referenced in the New Testament, it, it speaks of God's people. God's people, Christians, are called the temple of God, God's dwelling place, the house of God. And so we do see a shift from the Old Testament use of the house of God or the tabernacle or the temple to what we see in the New Testament after Jesus Christ. We are the dwelling place of God. But nonetheless, we gather together as followers of Jesus Christ and we come to this building and we may refer to it as the house of God and it's good for us to gather together whether it's in a building whether it's in a field it doesn't matter where the building is the point is it's good for God's people to gather together it's good for us to come and worship the Lord it's good for us to come before the Lord and to come to the house of God but what does it say here guard your steps when you go to the house of God Make sure we're going with the right heart. Make sure we're in in a right spot when we go. Even if our heart is not right, we pray, okay, God, help my heart to be right. Uh, not, Not going thinking that just going and going through the motions is somehow going to be pleasing to God. Now, there may certainly be times that your heart is not right, that you say, I just don't want to go to church this morning. I just don't feel like going to church. I just don't feel like everybody give me a hug. I had a bad week. I just, I'm in a bad mood this morning. Everybody's going to ask me how I am, and I'm going to have to smile and say everything's okay. And some of you are saying, whew, there's other people that feel like that. But that's the fact of the matter is sometimes maybe we just don't feel like seeing other people. But that's that's not exactly what I've got in mind or what I think that the passage is talking about here when it says, you know, guard your steps, make sure your heart is right. Maybe on those days our heart is not right, but it's not because we're, we're thinking we're coming in uh, and trying to fake God out by our actions. Maybe we just need to say, okay, God, I'm not really feeling it today, but God, you are worthy of my worship regardless of whether I'm feeling it or not. So God, help me to go and help me to find you and to praise you and to worship you even though my day is not that good. But what he says here is guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Better to draw near in obedience than to offer the sacrifice of fool as fools do, for they ignorantly do wrong. And so here we see what's talked about here in this little short passage frequently, and that is the fool. The fool goes before the Lord and offers a sacrifice, but it appears it's a sacrifice with a wrong heart. They, they do so ignorantly. And that's what we see in the Psalms, that what God desires is not burnt offerings as much as he desires a good heart. So it's possible for us to come into the house of God and to go through all the motions and to offer a sacrifice or an offering or whatever it may be, but totally be doing it with the wrong motivation. Maybe we come to church to be seen or we pray long prayers to be seen or we make sure somebody sees us putting money in the offering plate or doing whatever it may be. These are the types of things that Jesus addressed and that we saw addressed 
in the New Testament, that people were, were giving the sacrifices or doing the right things, but they were doing the right things with the wrong motivation. And that's fools. Fools do that. And so when we want to go, when we, when we get ready to come to the house of God and to worship God, we need to say, okay, God, one, we're coming just for God. And even if we're not having the best day, then say, God, help me to have a better day and help me to get something from your word and help me to enjoy those people that I'm going to be around that's going to love me and that I love them. And that even if we go to the house of God having a bad day, that maybe we'll leave having a better day. But we certainly don't want to be those who come in and act as fools in our, in our, in our motions and the things that we think and the things that we do that are from a wrong heart. That is a foolish thing that is done in ignorance, it said. Verse 2, do not be hasty to speak and do not be impulsive to make a speech before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. Now, perhaps this is part of what the fool does. Perhaps they make their speech hasty. Perhaps they come to the house of God not with the right heart, but yet they say all the right words. Oh, God is so good. Oh, I come to praise God. When all the while, they don't really care about it. They're coming, they're going through the motions, but, but they're not really praising God. They're just making a show for themselves. And maybe that's part of what the foolishness is here. Don't be hasty to speak. Now, this is, this is a good thing for us to consider. We see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see it in the book of James. We, we see it from time to time. There's a time to speak and there's a time to be quiet. And that's a struggle for us sometimes because sometimes we, we speak when we need to be quiet and we're quiet when we need to speak. And so we need to remember this very important thing, and that is don't be hasty to speak. So sometimes it's better just to keep our mouth shut. And do not be impulsive to make a speech before God. Now, the context here seems to be not just speech in general. While it's good for us not to be hasty in our speech, but in particular here what's being spoken of is don't be hasty in our speech to God. Maybe we need to be quiet if we're feeling a little foolish if our heart's not in the right place, that we don't just offer up a bunch of words for the sake of offering up a bunch of words if the words that we, in fact, are offering are not heartfelt words to the Lord. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. And so we see this idea, okay, if we're, we're just sinful human beings and God is the God of the universe, the creator of all things. We are just lowly earthly beings, but God is above all. He is the authority. He is the king. He is the one who sits on the throne. He is in heaven. And so should not we respect and honor God? Should not we think about such things before we open our mouth and speak that maybe we need to allow our words to be few and Perhaps we think about the story of um, of Esther. We just covered that. It hadn't been too long ago, a couple of years maybe. And you may recall that to save her people, she had to go stand before the king, which was a big deal because you couldn't just be up, on, up, up in there and, uh, and see the king. You had to go by invitation. Well, she wasn't invited, but she knew she had to speak up or her people were going to be killed. And there's that idea. Okay, I'm just the lowly queen. Even though she was the queen... There was a certain a certain honor and a certain respect. You don't just you don't just blow your way up in there before the king, right? Because the king is in this place of authority, in this place of honor, and so you must approach the king as such. Now, in her case, praise the Lord, when she came before the king, he reached out his scepter, which was a sign that okay, you're free to come up. But she came before the king with some humility, there, with some reverence, with some honor, with some respect. And that's how we need to approach God. We need to approach God in the same way. We come to the house of Lord. We want to have a good heart. We want God to work on our heart. If we're, if we're not having a good day, if our heart's not good, uh, we, we want to come before God with a sense of reverence and respect and honor, knowing, okay, I'm a sinner and God is God. So, so let my words come from the heart and let my words be few. Now, I don't believe that that's necessarily saying that if you, if, you, if you say a lot of words in and of themselves, that's evil. But oftentimes, as we talk about the fool here, the fool says words just to say words. Now, if you're just saying words to say words that aren't from the heart, then that's not a good thing. 
Whether you say a few words from a wrong heart or a lot of words from a good heart, you can say a few words, and if you're foolish and they're from the wrong heart, they're no good. You can say a lot of words from a good heart uh, with the right motivation, and that is a good thing. But the point here, I believe, is that there should be this respect and this honor and this reverence before God. We come to the house of God to worship God, and we need to remember that God is in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven, holy be your name. And so instantly when we pray, we think about, okay, God is up. We think about, you know, that's kind of our mindset. God is up here and we are down here. God is perfect and we are sinners. And so let us not be foolish but let us be those who are wise and humble when we go before the Lord. Now, this particular passage kind of kind of covers a few different things that that it's not obvious to me at least if these things are connected and if they are connected how they are connected. So that may be something that you want to look at in more detail and and, and see, but there's it appears to be at least maybe three different things here that we see. And they may have some connection between them, or they may not. They may just be kind of some random things uh, that he's bringing up here. But verse 3, For dreams result from much work, and a fool's voice from many words. There's that idea we just talked about. When the fool speaks, uh, they, they think they're heard by their many words, and, and they just speak and speak and speak and ramble and babble and babble and babble. Just a bunch of foolishness that's not necessary. And then we have this part about dreams there at the first part of the verse. For dreams result from much work. Now, I suspect everybody in here has had dreams before. And what is the cause of our dreams? Well, at least one cause of it we see here is too much work. Perhaps that has been the case. You work and you work and you work and you're stressed and you got work on your mind and you go to sleep and you can't hardly go to sleep because you're thinking about work and then you finally go to sleep and then you dream about your work and you don't get any rest and you and you and you toss and you turn and you dream all night. And he says here that dreams result from much work. Now what's that's got to do with anything we're talking about here? I'm not entirely sure. But nonetheless, that is what the text says. Verse 4, When you make a vow to God, don't delay fulfilling it, because He does not delight in fools. Fulfill what you vow. Now here we talked about the fool that goes to the house of God. Obviously the fool, the fool's heart is not right. The fool goes in ignorantly, and the fool speaks many words, and uh, the fool... Uh, delays in fulfilling his vow and so the foolish person that's going before the Lord there's a lot of strikes against the fool here these are things that we need to to check ourselves with okay are, are we being foolish when we come to God are we coming with a true heart of praise or are we are we just going through the motions are we speaking many words thinking we're somehow going to fool God by our words that we speak or fool others by the many words that we speak are we obedient to God or do we make foolish vows to God that we never intend to keep? Oh, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to bless you. God, thank you for being good to me. And if you answer this prayer, if you do this thing for me, then I'm going to, I'm going to be yours and do whatever you call me to do and make such vows or promises to the Lord and don't ever follow through with actually serving the Lord and living for the Lord. That's what fools do. When you make a vow to God, don't delay fulfilling it. Because he does not delight in fools. Fulfill what you vow. Better that you do not vow than that you vow and not fulfill it. Don't let your mouth bring guilt on you. And do not say in the presence of the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry with your words and destroy the work of your hands? Now, there in verse 6, my translation says messenger. Some of your translations say angel there. Uh, the word that's, that, that, that is sometimes translated angel and messenger is the same word. Uh, sometimes when we see that word, it may be talking about like a heavenly being and what we would think about it as an angel, but sometimes it's just talking about a human messenger. Uh, perhaps it's talking about the priest here. Perhaps it is talking about an angel of some sort. Uh, as it says, do not let your mouth bring guilt on you and do not say in the presence of the messenger or the angel. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that would mean if it's speaking about an angel. Perhaps there's this idea that angels are watching over us in some way and when we speak such things, 
It is in the presence of an angel. And don't say, oh, I made this crazy vow that I didn't keep. Oh, but it was a mistake. It was an error. I, I, I didn't mean to say that or I shouldn't have said that. So don't say those things. So it could be that this is to be taken in, in, in that it's before some angelic being. Or it could just simply be a messenger of some sort, a priest or someone uh, that God has appointed for something. Uh, it's hard to know exactly in that text. But your translations may say messenger, may say angel, may say something even different than that, but probably just those two things. But when you make a vow, don't delay, because uh, better not to vow than for you to vow and not fulfill it. And it says, do not let your mouth bring guilt on you. Now, this is an, uh, an important verse to consider as far as making vows. Now, I don't know how often we make vows before the Lord or that we should make vows before the Lord. That seems like that, that in some way could be a dangerous thing. And so... I suppose that even if we are going to make a vow before the Lord, the point is don't do so rashly. If you're going to make a vow before the Lord, then you need to be willing to do whatever you say, God, I'm going to do this, then you need to be able to do it. And it's not always going to be easy. Perhaps the best example of this is found in uh, Judges chapter 11, the story of Jephthah. You may recall this story several years back when we went through the book of Judges. We talked about Jephthah for three weeks. You can find those sermons online if you want to go back and hear more about this story. We talked about this in great detail because it's a, it, it deserves a little time and we will not spend that time on it tonight. But, but the short version is, is that Jephthah, uh, one of the judges of Israel, was, was up against the Ammonites. And he said, God, if you'll deliver these Ammonites over to me, if you'll help me to defeat them, whenever I get home, the first thing that comes out of my house... I'll, I'll dedicate to you and offer it as a burnt offering. And lo and behold, he gets back to his house, and the first thing that ran out of his house with his daughter. Now, this is a, this is a difficult passage. What did Jephthah do? Did, did Jephthah offer his daughter as a burnt offering or not? Well, the text is not really clear there. And so there's a lot of debate as to whether or not he did that. Now, in the context of, of the message, as you, as you read that passage, especially toward the end of the passage, it says that his daughter went off with her friends and she mourned her virginity. Now, that seems like, a, like a, an odd thing. If you're about to die, if you're about to be sacrificed, you would think that maybe you wouldn't care so much about your virginity. But then again, maybe that was super important. Hey, I've lived my whole life up to this point. I'm never going to be able to have children. That was a big part of the culture. So maybe that was part of what she was mourning for, knowing that she was going to die. She would never be married and have children. However, there's different interpretations and some differences there as to the possibility that maybe he dedicated her to the Lord but did not offer as a burnt offering. Rather, uh, she remained a virgin. That is, he said, okay, you're the Lord's and, and you're not going to get married. You're not going to have children. That's a whole different discussion we talked about that, like I said, probably for an hour, that, that one particular topic, and looked at the different, different interpretations there. But regardless of, of what actually happened to Jephthah's daughter, whether he simply dedicated her to the Lord and that kept her from being able to live and be married and have grandchildren for Jephthah, well, that would certainly be a punishment for him. As we well know, even in our community with some grandparents here tonight, there's a new grandbaby in the world, and that's a beautiful thing. And so to imagine if you're a father and your only child is not going to be able to bring grandchildren into the world for you, that would, that would, be, that would be a pretty big punishment, especially in that culture. And so if that is indeed what, what the vow that Jephthah made, the result of it was, was that he was not going to be able to have grandchildren and his daughter would not marry, well, that was, that was you know, he brought some guilt on him by making a rash vow. On the other hand, if, if, if he did, in fact, offer his daughter as a burnt offering, then that was certainly a, something to make him think, too. Man, I should have not, not said what I have said. Now, that particular interpretation comes with some difficulties, too. I mean, even if you make a rash vow, would God desire for you to kill your own child just to uphold that vow? That is a lot to consider in that passage, but... When you talk about making rash vows before the Lord, that is probably the best passage that you could study. If this is a topic uh, that, that, that interests you, the story of Jephthah, uh, you can go back and find that in Judges chapter 11. And at the very least, regardless of what occurred to his daughter, 
the point and the moral of that story and the seriousness of it, it really grabs us. It's like, holy smokes, this was a, a serious vow that he made, and there was something that he had to follow through with that was to his own hurt, as the Scripture tells us. Sometimes we swear to our own hurt. And so the moral of the story is this. Be careful about making rash vows. God, if you do this for me, God, I'll do this for you. Now, maybe we're guilty of making such promises. Maybe we have kept our promises to God, or maybe we have not, and that's, that's not a good thing. And so what's the best thing to do is not make a vow. It's better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Now, better than both of those is to make a vow and to fulfill it, but there's a lot of danger in making that vow should you not fulfill it. And so we need to be careful that we don't be as the fool here, that when we go before the house of God, that we don't go in with foolishness and wrong motives, that when we go into the house of God, that we don't go in thinking we're going to be heard because of our many words, that when we go into the house of God, we don't go in making rash vows that may very well be to our hurt, just saying things, oh, I'll do this, I'll do that, with no real intention of loving or serving God, and then it comes back to harm us in the end. And so... What does he say at this at this at the beginning of this passage? Be on guard, be alert, ready, ready, uh, be ready for whatever comes that you don't that you don't go in the wrong direction and ask uh, and act as the fool acts. Why should God be angry with your words and destroy the work of your hands? Verse seven. For many dreams bring futility; so do many words. Therefore. Fear God. Now, here, right at the end of this passage, we got we got the dreams coming back into this thing again. Now, uh, some of your commentaries, or, or maybe even in your study Bible, it, it may say, "Oh, it's talking about you know daydreams there, uh, daydreaming about things are are meaningless." Well, I suppose that 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 could be what it means there. And that that doesn't seem to be what it what is being implied, at least not in the first verse that we looked at. It's, it's saying that those dreams result from much work. Now, I don't know that, that we could argue that daydreams come from much work. Daydreams come, probably come from, from not enough work. Sometimes I find myself daydreaming, and it's because I'm not working. And I got to say, oh, I got I to gotta get my mind off of that. I got to get back to thinking about what I need to think about. So I say all that to say I'm not entirely sure exactly what these dreams have to do with anything. Uh, maybe we do dream because we do too much work. Maybe we do daydream with something that's going on in our life, but those dreams perhaps are meaningless, and that's what he says here. For dreams bring futility, and so do many words. So our words need to be few. We will find that we probably get ourselves in a lot more trouble when we say many words than when we say few words. There are probably a lot of situations that we could avoid if our words were few. Now, in the context of this, it's talking about going to the house of God. It's talking about using too many words before God. It's talking about being a fool in these things. And so this is good advice when we come before the Lord that we don't ramble on thinking, oh, if I ramble on, God's going to love me more. But that whatever we say, no matter how long or how short it may be, the most important thing is that it comes from a heart that desires to serve God. What does he say? Therefore, fear God. And so when we fear God, that is the right motivation, that we come humbly before God, who is in heaven, as we are in earth. That's what we saw earlier in the passage. And so our fear of God will determine how we are going to interact with God. Are we going to treat God reverently and with honor and with respect? And if we, if we go bebopping around like a fool, uh, not fearing God, then we're not going to treat God like who he is, like God. We're going to treat him like something that we're mocking and making fun of. And we should never treat God in such a way. We should never be foolish in that way. So what is the solution to not living in foolishness? It is to fear God, which is what we see and have talked about at the end of every message, I think, so far in Ecclesiastes. When all is said and done, there is only one thing that matters, and that is to fear God and to keep His commands. And all of these things, no matter how bad life may get, no matter how foolish we may, we may be tempted to become, when all is said and done, what, what is going to get us on track and keep us on track is that we have a proper understanding of who God is 
and that we respect Him and we honor Him and we praise Him and that we fear Him and allow that to guide us to do not foolish things, but things that come from a pure heart. Let's pray. Father God, we come to You. We thank You for these good words. And I pray, God, that You would help us not to be the fool. Perhaps there are times that we speak too much. Maybe we try to fool other people, dear Lord. Maybe we try to fool you, but you are not fooled by our many words or by our, our heartless sacrifices, dear Lord. Maybe we give them. Maybe we give the right sacrifices, so to speak. But, God, we don't do it from the right heart. We may serve you in some way, but we don't serve you with the right heart. So, God, let us not worry about anything that we can do to earn your favor because, God, there is nothing we can do. God, the sacrifice that is pleasing to you is your Son, Jesus Christ. And, God, through Him our hearts need to be changed. So, God, let our hearts come to you and come to your Word and come to your Son, Jesus Christ. Because, God, that is the sacrifice. There's nothing we can offer. There's nothing we can do because, God, you have done everything that needs to be done through Jesus Christ. So let us not be foolish to miss that. Let us not be foolish to think we can earn your grace, but God, let us, let us a- obtain it, dear Lord, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. God, let us come humbly before you and to fear you and to respect you and to have reverence towards you, dear Lord. Let us not be quick to speak and speak many words and make rash vows, dear Lord but just to seek you in all that we do. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.